Well, um, I'd like to say welcome to everyone here. This is my first archaeology and tea, so glad to see you all out. Okay. Um, well, I'm not going to keep you waiting th through my whole talk about our news. Um, we got news last week that we were awarded a $300,000 National Endowment for Humanities grant. Um, we are thrilled about that. Um, our main partner is the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and their digital humanities section. Am I too loud? Sorry. Okay. I'm probably loud enough without it. Okay. Better? All right. Uh, we, of course, partnered with Salmon Ruins Museum um, and the University of Virginia, who for more than a decade now has had the Chaco Research Archive. So the, the, the short summary of the grant is we're going to take the data at Salmon that we've helped conserve over the last dozen or so years. Many of you in the room have done that. Um, and we're going to create digital data and the metadata to go with it. And all that will be uploaded then to the Chaco Research Archive and become really probably the single largest representative for a, a single, the most data from a single site is what I'm trying to say in that archive. And that'll be accessible to researchers and to interested lay people. So we're really excited about that. Um, let's jump into Chaco's legacy and what we're really talking about. Um, okay, so Chaco Canyon, the center of our picture and the center of what we're talking about today. So quite appropriate. Um, up to the middle San Juan region, right in here, the site at Solomon Ruins, Aztec Ruins, and all the other areas. Um, to focus just for a minute on what um, Bill mentioned, one of the main initiatives that I'm part of uh, right now is to try to get protection for this larger Chaco landscape. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, um, oil and gas activity has sort of increased exponentially in the last five or six years in the area. Um, fortunately, with the current drop in oil prices on the world market, we've seen a little bit of a downturn in that, which of course affects economies in different ways. You know, it's not all good news or bad news, but what we've seen over the last few years is a great deal of development in oil fields right in here, and especially sort of creeping downwards towards Chaco. So what we've been doing is doing public presentations, organizing meetings, working with the primary land managing agency, which is the BLM in Farmington for this, and trying to talk about different ways to get extra protection for areas that are going to be subject to, we think, increased oil and gas activity in the immediate area. Um, this includes perhaps putting larger protection zones around sites that we know about. Um, one of the main ones here, the North Road coming out of Pueblo Alto and going straight up this way. This is already an area that the BLM considers a special consideration area. So it takes more um, permitting regulation and, and different conditions to get in there to drill. We would like to see more protection put on that. Um, as part of a the priority planning process that Archaeology Southwest has done now, I think in six areas around the Southwest, we gave um, the BLM a number of GIS-based shape files that basically delineates for them, these are areas that we think need greater protection. Um, so they are actively considering this. They haven't um, you know, agreed to set all these areas aside, and that's probably not something we can hope for, but we are hoping that giving those sites extra protection and committing to a process that's known as a master leasing plan, the number of the BLM districts around the Southwest are going to, will give us more of a planning tool. That those MLP areas, basically line out areas for specific development, and they set other areas aside, not necessarily in perpetuity, but it gives environmental groups and archeological groups like ours more of a chance to weigh in on the planning process, and it slows down the speed at which some of these things happen. So these are a couple of the tools that are in sort of the toolkit that we're working with, um, as well as meeting with other folks in the area. One of the challenges for this large area, of course, is that the BLM manages only about 20% of these lands. So we have Navajo Nation lands that are in tribal trust. We have state of New Mexico lands. We have allotted lands that are essentially private land that is managed through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and by individual allotment owners. So it's a very complicated land ownership mosaic. Um, and that's why we're meeting not just with BLM, but also with Navajo Nation. I have a meeting next week um, with the folks in their historic preservation office. We're trying to pull BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, into sort of a more active management posture. 
They have given a lot of their functions over to Navajo Nation um, because of Indian self-determination, the process that's been going on for about 20 years. But BLM is still sort of the ultimate sign off, you know, signatory authority on this. So we're trying to have them consider some other options. So that's kind of a quick summary for you. If you folks haven't been to our website on, with the section on the Chaco landscape issue, there's a lot more information there. We put together a little film based on some flights we did in the fall over Chaco. We took up tribal leaders and discussed a lot of the issues. So there's a lot more information out there for you. And I'm glad to talk to anyone afterwards who's interested. Um, so let's kind of move along. I'm going to give you just a real whirlwind tour of this National Science Foundation project that launched this. So we got a National Science Foundation research grant, and then we followed up with their informal science education program to fund the Chaco's legacy. So it was sort of a tag team approach, and we were really excited to do this because so many archaeologists and other professional scientists do research and they explore interesting aspects of our world but they don't follow up with a strong public interpretation of that. And we felt, you know, we feel at Archaeology Southwest with Bill's leadership that that's a very important part of everything that we do. If we don't have people understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it, then ultimately we're really not accomplishing the goals that we feel are central to preservation archaeology. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to read through all this, but a, a list of different team members doing different aspects of material culture studies and sort of the essential question for us, um, let me jump back, was whether or not folks from Chaco Canyon actually migrated from the canyon to sites in the middle San Juan, primarily the sites at Aztec, seen here, and then Solomon Ruins, as well as some smaller sites, also with great house type structures in the Chaco style in the area. And this is a question that people had pondered for at least 100 years, well back into the late 19th century. Earl Morris did extensive work here at Aztec, and Earl was convinced after digging for about five years that Aztec was definitely a Chaco colony. Um, at Salmon Ruins then, Cynthia Irwin Williams came along in the 1970s to study the site and, and did about a decades long project. And Cynthia, for her part and with her staff, concluded that yes, there had been a migration, a movement from people out of Chaco to these sites in the north, and she used the term colonization, that these were colonies. But no one had ever actually gone through the process of scientifically testing, we felt, fully, the idea that Chacoans had actually migrated out of their, their hometowns, their places in Chaco Canyon, to the north, to not just establish small sites, which we see across much of the Chaco world. We see small, could even be single family dwelling type sites, built in the massive Chaco Great House style, big thick walls, you know, 10 or 12 foot ceilings, but smaller sites. What we see in the middle San Juan are the largest sites outside of the canyon. So 450 rooms at the Aztec West site, Solomon Pueblo over 300 rooms. So clearly these were built for a different purpose than the sites that might be 10 or 12 or 14 or even 50 rooms. So a real different <coughs> approach, approach we thought and prior researchers had thought to the establishment of colonies in this area. So we went through a process and we looked at architecture, we looked at ceramics, we looked at patterns in ceramic symmetry, how people actually paint designs on vessels, we looked at site layout, we went through a process and basically we're asking the basic question, can we identify patterns in Chaco Canyon in these material culture areas that we can then detect in the northern areas and be relatively certain that these were made by, if not the same groups of people, then related groups of people who had gone through a similar process as they learned to do things. If you think about the way we do different crafts, even in the modern world, a lot of times we learn as um, master and apprentice, mother and daughter, father and son. These are the types of patterns we were looking at. What we describe as learned patterns of behavior in really specific ways that aren't necessarily replicable if you just go and look at them, okay? So let's take this beautiful architecture at Salmon. For example, um, you probably wouldn't have been able to, in the 11th or 12th century, if you observed Salmon Pueblo, to build a massive site like that if you didn't understand all the specifics of how to build a big site, how to site it, how you actually put walls together, et cetera, et cetera. So it's those modes of practice and specific craft industries that we wanted to look at as we went through the project. Um, 
So um, the other key issue, of course, was migration. This is Jeff Clark's definition. Jeff, of course, is one of our preservation scholars and has done really outstanding migration research now for almost 20 years. So we were looking at people moving their primary residences from one place to another. A fairly easy concept and idea. What's interesting, though, is as we went through the process, presented some of our results to the professional community, the biggest criticism we got, I think, was people saying, oh, Chaco to the northern middle San Juan, that's not a migration. This was a distance, folks, of at least 50 miles. And we had literally archaeologists telling us that that was a single community strung out from Chaco Canyon through Solomon and Aztec all the way to Mesa Verde. You know, and that distance is something like 140, 150 miles on a line. So that was sort of an interesting criticism. We, of course, rejected the criticism and said, yeah, we're right. We're moving on. <laughs> no, we took it to heart and tried to understand it, but in the end felt like this definition clearly applies in the situation that we were studying. The material culture was very similar, and I think that's what gave some people pause. Um, okay, so just to look briefly then at architecture as a particular material class that we might study, we were looking at ways that we might be able to detect this Chaco mode of construction. And if you look on the high visibility attributes, you see, you know, you build a big site, it looks like a large site, you have a certain orientation to it, you might have T-shaped doorways, et cetera. But as you get to the low visibility traits over on the right, there's a specific way you put together great house walls. And if you don't understand how to do that, you're not necessarily going to build a Chaco great house that lasts. One of the you know, amazing things about these structures is many of them are still standing. Aztec to this day on, in both its east and west ruins has intact roofs, about a dozen, in a dozen rooms in both places. Um, that's because they built it right. One of the key attributes we discovered was to build a massive site and have it stand up, you have to put a foundation on it. Now, of course, we build in the modern way in this fashion. We build with concrete and other materials reinforced. The Chacoans dug massive trenches about a meter wide and a meter deep, and they filled them in our area with cobbles as the underlying foundation. And then they put their walls, their major walls, directly on those cobble-filled foundations. And this, we found, was a key trait for detecting Chaco built versus maybe we're going to copy a Chaco site. We have a number of sites across the region that are literally Chaco replicas that were built in unusual positions. A couple of great houses up in southwest Colorado where they built in the massive Chaco style, but literally on the remains of an old site. One is built on a midden site and it, it didn't survive. And the reason is it wasn't properly you know, put into a foundation. Um, one of the challenges we had is we looked then at these 20 or so great house sites to decide Chaco, locally built, or some kind of combination or hybrid, is about a third of them hadn't been excavated and we basically had no data whatsoever. So, you know, we don't always end up with totally clear cut results. We found that about a third of the sites we looked at were Chaco built. About a third seemed to have been built by local folks trying to emulate the outward style of Chaco. And then the third group in the middle, we literally didn't have enough data to decide. So anytime a scientist tells you they have 100% data, don't believe them. They're lying. They're, now, there's a lot of equifinality is what we talk about in our field. Um, and sometimes you just can't ultimately say we figured it out. OK, another example. Um, this is work that Lori Webster did. Now, Lori works primarily, as many of you know, with perishable media, um, different types of basketry, textiles. We had this amazing preserved wood at both Aztec and Pueblo Benito, and she was doing a direct comparison of these items. And this is really just a highlight of what she was doing. She found great technological similarity in the types of wood chosen, the way the paint was applied, the patterning in the paint, and ultimately, in a more visible sense, the, the stylistic um, rendering of those elements on the wood. Now, these are thought to be um, ceremonial in sort of the broad measure. We're not particularly sure they might have been some sort of altar equipment or furniture. Um, these are so similar, um, this example and a bunch of others, that there's the idea that perhaps the same artist or the same family of artists, or certainly a closely related guild, if you will, created these items for use first at Pueblo Benito and then several hundred years later at Aztec. So this is a strong sense of continuity from one place to another and definitely had us um, 
understanding and reaching the conclusion that we had strong linkage and movement of people from Pueblo Benito, other sites in Chaco to the north. Um, the specific area that I was responsible for as we looked at this larger question was the settlement pattern. So a number of the Great House sites, which you see illustrated in this slide, how did those sites compare to each other? Um, what Chaco attributes did they have? What Chaco attributes did they lack? And sort of how all that might have fit together. Um, so as I told you a minute ago, there was these thirds, third Chaco built, a third probably local built, a third sort of floating in the, in the middle waiting for more data. Um, and this illustrates sort of the theme that I want to finish on for today before I hand off to Doug, which is as we looked at this area, we did feel that we found strong evidence of migration for some groups to the middle San Juan, but we found very strong local traditions as well. Um, in the La Plata Valley in particular, this is this area right in here. This is a long, yeah, this is a long river valley that runs up from Farmington all the way into Colorado and heads up here in the Colorado mountains. This river valley in particular manifests early Pueblo activity at the Basket Maker II, Basket Maker III interval, so four to 500 AD by 600, a very strong presence of people, and then all the way through the sequence until abandonment in the late 1200s. This valley stood out distinctly from the Animas River and the San Juan River, where the two big sites are located with this great depth of research or of occupation in those areas. Um, so again, I'm, I've given you sort of a, a whirlwind tour of this, but we ultimately found good evidence for migration of Chacoans to the middle San Juan. We found good evidence for emulation, copying of certain Chacoan traits all the way up to the massive buildings. And we found a great deal of variation from one river valley to the next as to how all these traits manifested themselves. So, you know, as we study any aspect of culture, it's, it's not surprising that things are complicated and there's great diversity. Um, so I will leave it there for you. Thank you. This is the, um, this is the starting screen for the exhibit that we created for uh, Salmon and Aztec, uh, the visitor center at both Salmon Ruins Museum and, and Aztec Ruins National Monument. And what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about um, the development of this exhibit, the philosophies behind it, and what we thought we wanted to do and what we actually accomplished. Originally, the idea was that a, a virtual uh, exhibit would, um, would, attract, uh, a better, would better attract kids to be interested in the past, to be interested in archaeology. But we sort of found out right away that that really wasn't true. Um, I've, I've learned this over the past 10 years. Um, virtual exhibits actually do much better with older audiences. And trying to figure out why, it became really obvious um, talking with a young nephew. Um, you know, it was like, this is nice, but it's nowhere near as good as my Xbox. <laughs> and you know, it's the truth. The, the kids have become really sophisticated consumers of digital media. So our, our next idea was, well, if, if games is what's driving this, why don't we try to adopt a game engine and try to serve archaeological content through a game engine? And so what a game engine really does is it creates a virtual world, it puts someone inside that virtual world, and then it lets them maneuver around and, and look at things on their own pace and on their own schedule, um, learning things as they go. So our first effort was um, started with this virtual museum concept. And the idea with the virtual museum was it was this space that had some traditional sort of museum exhibits um, that people could wander around in and learn how to, how to navigate inside a virtual environment using the game engine. And um, then there would be portals to virtual worlds in places of the past where you could go through the portal and you would be in a, in a, a past village space. Here's one of our portals. We jump in and you get to wander around a virtual environment, a virtual, rec you know, a conjectural reconstruction of how a place of the past might have looked. For me, it was, it was just bliss. Um, <laughs> I, uh, previously, all of my work in 3D modeling, um, you had to pre-render out an animation and it took people on a pre-rendered, predefined path. It was interesting, um, the more effort you put into it, the be more beautiful it became. But it, it, it was predefined, and it seemed like that was part of the, the Xbox problem. Kids wanted the freedom to, to maneuver about. 
And so I got this all set up, and I, I called my colleagues, and I gave them copies of the exhibit, and it felt, just flopped flat on its face. <laughs> um, this, as, as Linda Pierce said, why am I here, what am I doing, and why am I lost in this stupid cornfield? <laughs> And everyone that I demoed the, the exhibit with, rather than hanging out in, the, in that cool great kiva, they inevitably wound up getting lost in the cornfields. And it was just, it was clear that, that this approach, um, you know, if I handed it to a gamer, they would immediately reach for the WAS keys that let people control video games. And I knew that I had them, with the, I had them then, but for everybody else in the world, it just, it just wasn't gonna fly. So it was obvious that we, we needed professional help. And I, <laughs> I um, met a uh, gifted programmer online and sat down with him and showed him our prototype and asked him what he thought. And he was just like, this obviously failed. You would never want to install this at a national park. <laughs> it, it won't pass the grandmother test. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, if your grandmother can't sit down with this exhibit and use it right away and get something out of it right away, you've blown it. It's just, it's, you, haven't, you haven't really done your job right. You, you're not serving information that people, in a way people can digest. And so we sat down and bounced the ideas back and forth, and we, d we went back to another type of game concept. Um, this one was not a first-person shooter. What I wanted was a first-person shooter, but <laughs> that wasn't going to fly. Um, but there was a g an early game called Myst, and Myst was like a series of puzzles laid out in a virtual world, and there were little devices throughout this game that transported you from puzzle to puzzle. You had to solve the puzzle to go, to, you know, to move on to the next node. And that suddenly, suddenly the, the idea started to make a whole lot more sense. We could create an exhibit based on a series of nodes through space and time and have buttons to transport them from space to space and that way there was interactivity in how you chose to go about and explore the content, um, but you didn't wind up lost in a virtual cornfield. <laughs> um, and so this, is the, uh, this was the model that we took. And this is the entry, to the, the entry screen to the Chaco's Legacy exhibit. We also realized that there's, there's a bunch of different ways people go to visitor centers and national parks. Um, and I've spent years uh, developing virtual exhibits for state parks and, and other parks around the Southwest. And you sit and you watch people actually use them. And, and generally there's two types of people, who, well, there's three types of people who will use a virtual exhibit. There's sort of the casual person who shows up and nudges it around for a little bit, gets bored and moves on. Then there's other people who would prefer to not do anything at all interactive. They would just prefer to watch a movie and then go tour the site. And then there's the type of person who will sit down at a virtual exhibit and go through every possible interpretive. They'll spend an hour um, exploring all of the content. So we wanted to author, we, you know, there's not, not, other than amazing graphics, not much is going to help the person who gets bored easily and is on their way. But we wanted to be able to, to, to serve content to the other two types of visitors. So we have this one mode, which is this one here. I'm sorry, this one here. Um, where it takes people on a 10-stop guided tour, and it takes about 10 minutes to go through, well, eight minutes to go through the exhibit, and it hits all of the key interpretive themes. Um, all of the things Paul just described are discussed on this special guided tour that takes people through Chaco Canyon. The other one is, is more interactive, and that's the one I'm going to take you through today just so I can t t quickly take you to some of the uh, uh, highlights and we can have a little more time for questions later. I'm not sure if I have another slide here or not. Oh, well, let's just take a step back. Um, for this project, we intended to serve all of Chaco Canyon. We wanted people to be able to go all through Chaco Canyon and then be able to migrate up to Salmon and Aztec. Um, so I needed to build a model of Chaco Canyon, and um, I bit off way more than I could chew. <laughs> um, but we had Adriel Heise mount this amazing camera on his aircraft and he flew transects up and down Chaco Canyon, shooting photography down. Um, basically, he shot, actually he shot digital video for about five passes, and then I extracted about 3,000 frames from that digital video and plugged it into this new type of software called photogrammetric analysis software that spits out a 3D model of what it sees in photographs. So that created for us a, a model of five by seven miles of, of digitized Chaco Canyon. 
And the problem was is that the game engines, the game engines were great at rendering flat areas. They were great at rendering hills, but sharp canyon walls just didn't work. So we had to build our own, our own model of the canyon surface. Here's the first user of the exhibit. She was eight years old. She said it was really cool. <laughs> and I'll get back to this one in a second. Um, give me one sec here. Okay, this is the actual exhibit itself running. And I've, I've turned off the soundtrack um, so we can move through, through here closely without you hearing Paul's narration of the <laughs> entire exhibit. At least I think I have. Nope. <laughs> well, you can see that each interpretive node has an audio file attached to it. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and we are in Chaco Canyon in, during the early Bonito phase. It's about 8850. And we come into our first small house site. And we can do fun things like go inside the pitch structure, select an artifact, play with that artifact in 3D. Information gets served through a variety of ways. And so what the system does is it allows us to create interpretive nodes, the navigation tools to move in between interpretive nodes, and we can serve inf more information. Um, this is actually a, a preview of the, the final version of this exhibit. In the final version of the exhibit, we have a, a map browser that shows you exactly where you are in, in space. Um, and we're going, we're at, we've added the ability to serve all of this content in multiple languages. So let's proceed on to, so things have moved up. A, 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 during this time period, life in Chaco was mostly in these small house sites. There were about 150 of these small house sites going up and down the Chaco Wash in Chaco Canyon. Um, the other thing we have here is we have the ability to share alternate viewpoints. This is archaeology. Things aren't settled. Um, Steve Lexon has a completely different concept of what kivas are for in Chaco Canyon than we do. So um, I've always liked the ability to share multiple points of view, multiple opinions, and, and put the argument out there for people to let them, let them use their own judgment skills to decide what they, you know, what they think of this content, even if it is a little silly. And so there were, again, there was 150 of these small house sites spread out between um, both ends of the, of the park. So, it, but at three sites, something different was happening. So we're going to jump over to Unavita. And this one was different. They decided to go multiple stories. Um, something, something, some different cultural pattern was starting to show up. So um, we're going to take a about a five-mile flight here, and I think I've got them all, but if you look closely, there's still probably two or three flying trees. <laughs> so far, so good. So we're sliding down Chaco Wash. And we come to the site of Pueblo Benito. Um, probably not the Pueblo Benito you're familiar with because this is Pueblo Benito in 850 AD. This is its first construction phase. Um, I showed this to Bill Robinson and he remembered working in these structures and remembered recovering the tree ring samples that showed that these were the earliest uh, structures on the site. So, um, so let's change times. So now you start to see how the great houses are starting to evolve. Things are changing. There's a, there's, something's changed in the social organization. Some people are, are, have a very different idea about uh, ways to live. The small house sites still exist, but they've all moved to the north side of the wash. Great houses are on the south side, small houses on the, on the, south, on the north side. So let's go take a, take a quick look at some of the small house, what, what's going on with the small houses at this time period. And we come over here to the area called Chetro Kettle. I'm not Chetro Kettle. Um, Casa Riconata, sorry. Um, so let's take a look at the, the really famous Great Kiva here. And let's just go ahead and go inside. So I was really surprised that the Park Service had locked this off. Every time I had visited Chaco Canyon up to about 10 years ago, you could go down and walk around on the Kiva floor. But I always wanted to go through this tunnel. So we take this sort of secret tunnel that takes us into the bottom of, uh, underneath the kiva, and you can imagine that there were some screens that, you know, people sort of mysteriously appearing out of nowhere. 
But let's go back. Again, um, we have the ability to move or maneuver around all of these prehistoric structures. We can call up artifacts. And if you actually take the time to explore the rooms and explore the artifacts, all of these different interpretive themes get explored and explained. Um, I really like providing a lot of content for people who want to dig deeper. Okay, let's climb on out of this kiva. And let's go back to Benito. And let's go another 50 years in the future. Now, uh, Pueblo Benito is looking more like pr probably what most people would have expected it to look like. Um, you know, when we see it today, it's the end process of a long building cycle. And being able to share that through this, these maneuverings in time and space um, was one of our big goals. So we'll jump over to Chetro Kettle. Um, and the Talus unit has a way up the cliff face. And we'll climb on up. And we should wind up at Pueblo Alto. And from here we can migrate north. And we wind up at Salmon, where we can, um, I wanted to try to get in the Tower Kiva, but, but anyway, you can see the basic idea of the exhibit and um, the message it was trying to get across. Here we're gonna go up a single pole ladder, go down into a habitation room. And take a peek at some storage vessels and a ladder up. Um, but as we were creating this, um, and, and the exhibit would, again debuted in June, and um, it, it was well received, um, but we realized as we were creating this that um, what we really had was a system to, to share places in space and time. And so everything that you've seen here, it's all data-driven. Everything is based in tables that contain real archaeological data. When you call up an artifact, it calls a table entry up that you know, provides the curation information, where the vessel was from, all the detailed other information we can provide about the vessel. We can share photographs of the actual artifacts themselves. And this is, has evolved into something that we're calling chronological virtual reality. And I'm going to be debuting this system at the SAAs in, in two weeks. Um, but this is a system that we're going to just simply give away for free um, to not-for-profit and educational organizations. And suddenly virtual, ar virtual archaeology is a huge topic. Um, there's lots of other people doing 3D modeling now. Um, and so this provides people with a tool to share the past with, with other folks. And it's completely flexible. We can, we can declare six time periods or one. We can, we can allow people to change language on the fly, with, change time periods on the fly. Um, and all of this is coming together into a, what we hope is gonna be a really, really quite neat way of, of sharing the past with people. And it's something that um, you know, a good graphic designer can take this and redesign the shape and look of all of the buttons and change the font and create a very different sort of, different looking sort of program but the basic functionality of taking people through a virtual environment is, um, is still intact. And as we go forward, um, it's really looking like we're on the cusp of a, of a real revolution in terms of the ways that 3D modeling and 3D objects are gonna start interacting with our daily lives. Um, whether they're displayed out of cars or visors or whatever. Um, Folks who've got a decent library of ancient places, artifacts. Um, I've been doing this for, not since I was two, but since I was 16. Um, Archaeology Southwest has this giant library of virtual models of sites through time and space and objects through time and space. And these new three-dimensional reality display systems can use these things off the bat. Um, there was a, a neat little thing called Oculus Rift where you look into a box and you, your head is tracked and you're inside that virtual environment. The exhibit just timed out because it realized nobody was playing with it. Um, but moving forward, all of these assets that we've been collecting for a very long time are positioned to be used in some really fun and amazing ways. And I can't wait. It's, it, the next five years are gonna be so exciting in terms of using digital electronic media to interpret things for folks. And um, particularly when we can get Native Americans involved and get these exhibits in their languages, in their schools, I'm super excited. This is just gonna be a, a, a 
really interesting period of time. And uh, finally, I think I just want to wrap up um, by saying it's, it's, this has been a labor of love my entire life. And there are days I can't believe I get paid to do this. But <laughs> there are very few days I get to look around at a room full of people who've supported this all along and say thank you. So thank you all very much. And Paul, I think we're, we're up for questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the question is, um, so much is being done with, with Archaeo astronomy, and um, we now know there are so many places across the Southwest where people have built either architecture or stone carvings or what have you that interacts with solar angles and, um, you know, the, the sun dagger that comes across the spiral at, on, on the solstice and things like that. Um, I have not done this personally yet, but a colleague of mine at uh, Ball State uh, built Hadrian's Via, um, and then built a, a solar lunar simulator over the top of it where you could enter the day and time of any time during the Roman era and see what the sun and shadows would be doing. And it, it's absolutely possible. Um, it's something I hope to learn in the next couple months, but it's, it's uh, definitely doable. And I should take one more step back. Um, we just recently, excuse me, we just recently got a, a tremendous gift from the 3D modeling company Autodesk. They donated about $30,000 $30, worth of software for building onto this. And so one of the next things we're going to be able to do is start adding people. Um, these models look so much more believable when you have people going about their daily lives. And that's going to be added to this model, this modeling system very soon. That is a, a, just a fantastic question. Um, it's a, it is a serious issue, and it's something that, that we're all trying to sort of grapple with right now in terms of, of how do you achieve just that. Um, with this exhibit, one of the first things we're going to be doing is adding, adding more photographs of all of the objects so that you get to see the photographic evidence of where these things were found and, and the context in which they were found. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's just going to come down to... Um, um, the credibility of the people making the model. Um, I saw a fantastic, just fantastic 3D model of an Egyptian funerary complex. It just blew my mind. They must have spent, they must have spent a year on it. And this Egyptian funerary con this complex is, was supposedly uh, at the base of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so your question is, 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 is spot on. Well, and I think the truth is we really can't control that. We do our best right now. As Doug said, this is open source. That's the way we want to go. We want people to add on and do good things. And you just monitor it and try and, uh, excuse me, keep the crap out of it <laughs> if you can. And there's been an evolution in, in copyright laws. And so we're using something called a Creative Commons license, which says you are allowed to use this. You are allowed to modify this. You are allowed to do whatever you'd like with it as long as it's not for profit or educational, as long as you attribute where you got this software from, and as long as you release whatever you release under the same agreement that we've released. Um, and it's a very, it's a very specific legal um, set of rules, and we will, be, we will be monitoring that very, very closely. Bruce. As a, as a matter of fact, we just, oh, the question is, um, are, we, are we looking at ways that um, these technologies could be used to more involve people with sort of solving questions for themselves, um, letting them have more access to the data, and, and by looking at that data, come to some of their own conclusions? Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, we just finished the field work on this project uh, about a month ago, or two months ago now, time's flying, um, for Pecos Pueblo. So we had Adriel Heise, drones are banned over the over National Park Service, so we had Adriel Heise shoot a couple of thousand photos over Pecos Pueblo, and the resulting 3D model that we got out of that was so crystal clear and so sharp, every brick, every rock, every tree, every bush, has all been mapped to the exact point of the surface of the Earth within 14 millimeters. 
So we have this amazing model of Pecos. We can see Cushing's trenches. Um, and we're really hoping that we're going to be able to take this work, um, try and get a National Endowment for the Humanities grant, build upon that, and let people see all of the logic behind the development of the Pecos sequence, to let them remove layer by layer and see the different glazeware sequences as they come out. Um, I'm really excited about it. And yes, we we have definitely been thinking about this. And I should point out that this will be, this will hopefully be, will be released on the 100th anniversary of the publication of an introduction to Southwestern Archaeology. Yeah. Have you talked to the National Park Service about using tools like this to enhance the interpretive experience when they're in Chicago? We have. Um, they just simply don't have any money for it. Um, we are... Um, I'm going to ask again when, when the, the final version of this, of this is finished, because if we can, if we can incorporate Navajo, um, Zuni, Akama, Kurson, um, if we can I incorporate all of these native languages, uh, it becomes an interpretive tool that's, that may be just too good of an offer for them to refuse. That's what I'm hoping anyway. Well, and this exists at Aztec Ruins, although we've got one problem we're solving for them, and it's currently at Solomon Ruins Museum, so it's in those two places. And I think Chaco, Chaco will, will buy in eventually because it's the same superintendent, Aztec, and Chaco. We just haven't gotten fully through the process with the folks at Chaco. Yes. Um, the really neat thing about this game engine is that um, once you write the exhibit, you can export the exhibit to just about anything. So it's not inconceivable that we could, we could burn this to CDs, that people could come home and play it on their Xbox, play it on their home computer. If anybody would like a copy of this exhibit, I'll give you the secret URL right now, www.archaeologysouthwest.org slash cl. C for Chaco, L for Legacy. You can download the exhibit to your home computer and explore it at your, at your own leisure. It's that easy. It's not on a menu, so you have to type it in. Yeah. It's not in a menu. <laughs> um, and right now we're at a, we're at a sort of a, a technological bottleneck with serving this as a web page. Um, it's going to be possible soon, but the problem is, is that to serve this as a web page right now, you have to download a plugin to to change your b web browser so it can run this content. And plugins are just, are just death on visitorship. And, um, best estimate is two to three people will actually download the plugin successfully and then run the page as a web page. So on that, on that CL link, it's a program, it's an application that you download to your computer and run it on your computer rather than trying to serve this through a web page. The most recent version of this, of this game engine um, has, has built in a module that doesn't need a plugin to publish this stuff online. But what it's doing is it's using this program called C Sharp or C++, the code that this program is written in. It uses that to write a JavaScript program that runs on your browser. So if you can imagine a program translating to French to translate back to English uh, the, the, the approach is still a little uh, experimental, but we hope to get there soon. Sure. Um, the question was, why we, do we not see settlements on the Chaco River? Well, we actually do see settlements on the Chaco River. So, yeah, that particular map that I showed you, the last one, um, was focused on the Middle San Juan area. So there are quite a few settlements on both sides when the Chaco River runs east-west out of the canyon. It goes west, and then it makes the Great Bend and goes north. So there are great houses, oh, probably a dozen up and down that point as well. As you look at the map, though, and envision, here's the Chaco Park block, more or less. If you go straight north up the North Road, there are three or four different great houses along the North Road. And then you get up to Coots Canyon, and then that's the route into Salmon, or you could go straight north into Aztec. So, so the sites along the Chaco River are west of what we're talking about, and they were settled at different time periods, but a lot of that was also in this sort of post-1050 push when people went out. Well, we think it was probably simultaneous, but the northern push that ends... Um, with these sites being built right around 1100 
Salmon a little before, Aztec a little after, is sort of the last great gasp of the Chaco system, at least in my view. We still have people living in Chaco Canyon until the late 1200s, but with this migration to the middle San Juan, a lot of the energy, perhaps the spirituality, the ritual center of Chaco did transfer to the north. Um, and that's Steve Lexon's idea originally that we, you know, we mapped onto and I think we fleshed it out quite a bit more. And then the interesting thing about Chaco, especially after 1200, is there's still people in Chaco, but we have no dates um, after, I think the latest date from Chaco, tree ring date is about 1128. So we know people are living in the buildings and the buildings were habitable for, you know, centuries after their construction. But as to what happens in Chaco, I think that's really one of our open questions is what's Chaco like in the 1200s? You know, we could get Gwen in here and have him talk about it, but he's, he told me one time, a quick answer for sure. I don't know. <laughs> a lot of that energy switched to the north and that's, you know, that sort of took us into our project. Okay. okay.